Bibles to Psalm 23. Mike, you got to go to the end of that sermon to find it. We're going to start in Psalm 23. And then we're going to get after it. Psalm 23. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Psalms 23. See you, Maris. Do y'all know he's going next week up to California to get his fiance and bring her back? Huh? Crazy, crazy, crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Oh, y'all did crazy stuff too. You know you did. Everybody get a little crazy. A little love bit. Mm-hmm. Are you comfortable? I heard groans all over the building. I didn't even look up, but I heard the building groaning, you know. Hmm. Mm-hmm. The Lord is my shepherd. And there are things, I, again, I can't prove, you can't disprove. But I believe David was a man of solitude. He was a man, I can prove that, that he was a man that went to the caves, and was out in the fields. I believe most of the things that he wrote were either reflections back while he was in the palace or... If he had parchment and pen, he would do it into the fields or caves. But he was a man who, who understood. Like, you know, and when Jesus came, you'd find, like we talked about last week, Jesus on the mountainside, 3,000 feet in the air, and, uh, you know, that climb, and they brought up the, the lame and the maim and the, and the people that were uh, full of uh, ailments and threw them down at his feet, and he healed them. He hurt for them. <clears throat> but Jesus, the Bible says, when he got in his place is when he done it. A lot of uh, people I know get out of place. You know, God made you for a specific place. And when you find that place, it's an amazing thing. Whether you're a mother, father, your children, it's just an incredible place to be in. So we find David, his place was probably the cave. I think he liked the caves. He liked the solitude. He liked the pasture more than he did the palace. Just something about him. And he said, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Everybody say restoreth. When you see re, it's a prefix on the beginning of a word. It means to do again. It means God does it again. When you go through recovery, that means you're getting something back. Restoration, you're getting your store back. Uh, re, 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 to, to restore means to get back that which you once had. Which tells me that the re restoration of the soul is an ongoing uh, process in your life. You never get to a place where your soul is all right. It's constantly you're dealing with it. We'll talk about that. Going to go a little deep, so you're going to have to pay close attention to me. Try not to shoot over anybody's head here, because I'm learning this as I'm going myself, all right? He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I can't even read that without thinking about the poster I had on my wall when I was a young teenager. And I didn't know Jesus, and the first part of that scripture was there. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for I'm the meanest. And then it goes on. And I had to tear that poster up after I got born again, along with Farrah Fawcett. Amen. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. What I like to say, my cup won't hold. Amen. It just, it just keeps running over. All of this, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All of what David said precedes the first four words of verse 3. He restores my soul. In other words, my restoration has to do with me walking among the enemies and going through the valley, handling death. If I get my soul right, and you are body, soul, and spirit. Here's what I found in life. The older I get, I've had a toothache before. You ever had a toothache? Amen. It's an Arkansas word, toothache. <laughs> well, if, you know, the toothbrush was invented in Arkansas because it hadn't been invented anywhere else. It had been teeth brush. It's all right, it's all right. I'm staying with you. I'm giving folk on t online time to catch up with us here. They're getting their Cheetos and their ginger ale. Uh, so when you got a toothache, you go to the dentist. When you get a backache, you put a patch on it, take care of it. You get a headache, 
You take a, a BC powder, an aspirin, something to take care of that. When your heart starts hurting and, you, and your air gets shallow, that heartache right there, you've you got to go to the doctor, amen, to let him take care of that. But we are body, soul, and spirit. The scripture teaches us that right off the bat. We're separated, body, soul, and spirit. And yet all three are together. It's like Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You can't separate them. It's like the egg, the shell, the yolk, and the white. It all runs together. So I'm not going to try to purposely separate things, but I want you to know there's a difference in your body, your soul, and your spirit. And we're going to walk through that because I, I entitled this Soul Lake. Everybody say Soul Lake. Soul Lake is so important to understand that inside of you, there, there is a soul. Thessalonians, I'm going to leave you standing just for a minute for a reason. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit, your whole soul, your whole body, be preserved blameless into the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calls you who also will do it. Faithful is he. Spirit, soul, body. The scripture lays them out. All three. That's who we are. Wholeness, the word means without fragmentation, put together properly, free from deformity, spiritually, soulfully, emotionally, and mentally sound. In life, we find that we go through this time where, where we want this wholeness in our lives. Wholeness is a powerful word. So our goal is to build the people who are whole in spirit, soul, and body. Not just spirit, but soul and body so that people catch it. We always talk about healing physically, but it's also mentally and spiritually if you would. Let me first talk to you about the body. And then I'll have you sit down a second. But I just want you to feel for me. <laughs> Genesis. Genesis. Chapter 2. Verse 7. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Neptis is the word in the Hebrew, a living soul. Something came alive inside of him. So God had this opportunity to make us. He is the greatest creator of all. I, I mean, I was just in Montana. You're talking about big sky country. Woo, man, I mean, the stars at night, the blue and the, the snow-capped mountains all around. God is such a beautiful creator. And the Bible tells us that, at, that heaven is a place that's got a street of gold. He's got pearl gates and jasper walls and sapphire. He uses these tremendous things. And God could have used any celestial substance he wanted to create you. He could have done anything he wanted to do to build you. But when God decided that he was going to make you, he reached down and he made you out of dirt. This didn't cost me much. I had my son get it out of the backyard. You came from dirt. I want, before you sit down, I want you to look at your neighbor. Say neighbor. Tell him, say neighbor. Did you know that you're a dirt bag? Amen. Now you may be seated. Let me talk to you about this body just a little bit. This earth suit, you've heard me call it for years. This earth suit is simply a bag of dirt. Now, God could have used anything he wanted to to create you, but we love this dirt, man. We dig this dirt. I saw some of you come in. I can tell that you just got showered because your hair was still wet. You wash this dirt. You pedicure this dirt. You manicure. Gentlemen, will manicure this dirt. We will put makeup on the dirt. It's a billion-dollar business for this dirt to take care of this dirt. Oh, we'll take this dirt to the doctor. We massage this dirt. We exercise this dirt. We just make sure this dirt's it. We feed this dirt almost anything it wants. Oh, man, we're constantly feeding the dirt. Oh, we'll take selfies of the dirt. We take dirt selfies, don't we, huh? And we never post the first one. No, no, that's four, five, six, seven, eight, and that one. I always get tickled at some of my kids because they post like. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, you never look that way, but only in the picture. Amen. It's funny how we, and then, and then I, I know certain ladies, I get tickled at them. Every picture. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? You look at a tea kettle. You're posting your dirt, and all it's all about dirt. On Instagram, it's on Twitter, it's on Facebook, it's dirt this and dirt that. And when you realize that, that we simply came from dirt. And, and we put deodorant on our dirt. Amen. We, we have surgeries on our dirt. We got dirt tucks. Huh? Dirt lifts. What are we doing? 
This earth suit, this dirt, the Bible says God made. And, and I, I got issues with him. I said, God, you could have made us out of anything beautiful, anything wonderful. But you chose. You chose. You chose to work with. He chose dirt. Because here's the thing. When you study the scripture and you walk this thing out, it, you know, and it would be a problem to me until we met Jesus, who works with dirt, who is a potter for dirt, who takes the clay and molds the dirt. Amen. He's not afraid to mold it. Though he's holy, he doesn't separate himself from touching us. He doesn't look at you and say, you know, you're, you're cheap as dirt. He doesn't talk to us that way. He looks at us as his, uh, his, his diadem of creation. And even though we're made out of dirt, and there were reasons why he did that. Dirt is the only environment. This is the only environment in the world that you can put a seed in that will produce after its kind. Dirt. You can't put dirt in gold and get something out of it. You can't put dirt in pearl. You can't put dirt in jasper. It won't produce. But if you take a seed and you put it in dirt, it will produce that which is it, whatever it is. Whether it be a peach or an apple or a watermelon, you put it in the dirt, it's going to bring forth that which it is. And so God said, you know what? I'm going to create my creation just like I've done the rest of them. I'm going to create them out of dirt. Therefore, I can put a seed in them. And they'll bring forth their kind. Now, the problem is, when this dirt bag gets with this dirt bag, they often have a bunch of little bitty dirt bags. <laughs> Everybody follow me with that? Yeah, I know you call them your daughter or your son, but they little dirt bags. You know what I'm talking about. But it's inside of every one of them is a gift. Inside of every one of them, there's something going on. The Scripture tells us this. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Another scripture says it this way. If you look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. Our earth suits, our clay, our dirt bags, if you would. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. In other words, we are simply made out of dirt. But inside of us is this seed, this treasure, this gift. And your life's quest is to find out what your purpose is in this world and to open up your gift. The Bible says your gift to make room for you. The Bible also teaches us that God don't repent for giving you a gift. That he put a gift down inside of you and you are to present that and that people will find your gift. They will come after it. So inside of everybody's dirt bag, somewhere there is a gift. And inside that gift... It's the most precious thing. And here's the thing I found out as I'm studying this thing. This thing has been formulating for over three weeks. Some of you are on a midweek service. You heard me just bring this up. And I've, been, I've been germinating on it. Germinating. Did you catch that word? The dirt I am has been thinking about this. But this gift right here is amazing. Did you know when you're dating and you're courting? Oh, yeah. You, you're all about your gift. You show your gift. You tell them how wonderful you are, how great you can do this, that, and the other thing. And all they see is your gift. And then you get married. <laughs> and they find out you're a dirtbag. <laughs> Where'd that gift go? Now, you, you're full of dirt now. Because, see, we don't show the good side of ourselves, do we? No, 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 that would be wrong. We don't show this. We show this. We make sure everybody sees this right here. But then you wake up next to him, and you didn't know his breath smelled like liver. <laughs> and her feet smelled like onions. <laughs> Everything starts shifting and changing. She squeezes the toothpaste in the middle. She puts the toilet paper underneath instead of over the top. Hey, Amen. You leave stuff hanging all over the house. I mean, you must have been one messy dude. Is that your underwear sitting over there? I've been there for three days. I ain't picking it up. You pick it up. Hey, Amen. And all of a sudden, the dirt starts coming out. This is life in reality. Same way with your pastor. I may be showing you a gift, but those that know me know that I'm a dirt bag too. Hey, Amen. Just like you. Look at your neighbor again and say, he's talking about you. Colossians 1.27 says, To them God has chosen to make known about the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Inside of us, not only these gifts, but Christ abides inside of us, inside this dirt. This is what makes things so wonderful, and that's why God gets all the glory. Listen, a gift is a powerful thing. My hands, if you threw me a football, oh, I could take it, and I might throw it to Sam. 
and it'd probably wobble on the way there. It ain't worth much for me to have a football. But, man, you take a guy like DeAndre Hopkins, who plays for the Houston Texans, who's a wide receiver, whose mother was doused with uh, Clorox and, and, and acid, and it scarred the side of her face, and it blinded her when she had three little kids as a single mother coming up. And she raised these little kids, and she brought them into a place. And DeAndre, as he began to move through life, he lived five minutes from Clemson University in South Carolina. He began to expose his gift, and now he is a millionaire playing for the Texans. And every time he catches a football and scores a touchdown in our stadium, he runs over and gives his mother, who is blind, the football so she could feel the gift of the dirt bag that she raised up that began to expose his gift to show the glory of God. I'm telling you, that, that when I read this, I realize I am nothing compared to him. That only thing good in me. People are like, What's good? Well, what do you know good, Pastor? I say only one. The rest of us need help. Yeah. Amen. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. What gifts I have, I've discovered through life. My mother tells me, Jerry, you discovered your gifts when you were in the 4-H club as a little boy. Amen. And you, you got up and gave speeches on dog training. I've always been into that. You would do stuff like, I said, I did? She said, yeah. And she would show me all the little awards that I got for doing that. She said, it started when you were young. You'd get on the steps, and I don't know where you heard a preacher, but you'd start preaching to the kids. I don't remember any of that, but my mama does. That the gifts are inside you. And you watch your kids come up. They all got gifts in them. They, they got, so I know some are extroverts, some are introverts. Some have different languages about them. Some like gifts, some like hu uh, hugs, affirmation. I understand all that. But everyone has a gift. And when you discover your gift, some of you, the best gift you could give this church is the gift of smile. You're on the internet. You're smiling right now. Smile. You know how many times churches would blow up and folk would just smile? Yeah. Amen. Wouldn't it help just a lot in life if you just smiled? If you just showed the gift of smile, of enthusiasm, of excitement about the great things of God in your life? Amen. Paul told Timothy before Paul died, I believe part of the last letter that he wrote in 2 Timothy, he told Timothy, stir up the gift inside you. Young man, stir it up. In other words, you've got to do something to make this thing happen. You stir up the gift inside of you and watch and see what happens around you. Amen. That gift. The, the word. Now, let's talk about soul. Now, <laughs> y'all good with this here? Yeah. Yesterday, when I told that congregation at the funeral, they were all dirt bags. They all just sat there. <laughs> and then I had to go and explain myself. And then I got a smile. And it was all good. Yeah. You got to be careful when you use that one. But I knew y'all could handle it. Your body, inside your body is your soul. The New International Version said man became a living being. When God breathed into him, he breathed into him that soul, that spirit. The soul is how you relate to others, how you understand yourself. It's the seed of your emotions. The concept of the soul seems to have fallen away, but all through different religions you'll read about the soul. The soul is how you relate. Amen. The difference in soul and spirit. And, I, and, and again, they're kind of hard here to, to figure out, but Hebrews 4 says, let us labor therefore to enter into the rest. How do you labor into a rest? Are you, are you catching the scripture? It's an oxymoron. Can I tell you, just, just sleeping and resting makes you tired. I said sleeping and resting makes you tired. But if I work, if I labor, if I, if I do something with this body, I find I get rest. Many folk don't sleep well at night because they don't work hard during the day. The times you work hard is the times you sleep well. Now don't, get, don't bite my head off. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How many times have I heard somebody say, Pastor, you read my mail today. You, you've been all up on, on the internet on me. You know, all, you, you know all about me. I don't know nothing about you. The Word of God does. And so when you preach the Word of God, it discerns. When you read the Word of God, it discerns. It works on you. It works on this earth suit. It works on your soul. It blesses your spirit. Amen. And it separates some things. According to Hebrews 4, the soul and spirit, they're separate, but they are connected. The soul is who you are, and the spirit is what you have. The spirit is vertical. It relates to God. 
My spirit's always pulling toward God. Every time now that I do a memorial and a funeral, I feel myself pulling closer to God. There's something about me that wants to move upward. But then my soul is relating to people. My soul connects with folk. When I'm around them, when I talk with them, when, when I reach for them, there, there's that connection that takes place. Your spirit understands God. Your soul understands man. Your soul feels for man. Your soul feels hurt, happy after him. Amen. But your spirit feels for God and after God. There are times I'm in church and my soul is saying, I don't want to worship. Your mind. That's it right here. Your mind. You know, your mind you say, I don't want to. I don't feel like it. So the body and the soul get together. And the body said, you cool with that soul? The soul said, yeah, I'm cool. Let's just stay here with our hands down. Just kind of hang out here before the work. But all of a sudden your spirit begins to take over. And your spirit begins to do things that your soul and your body don't understand. But the next thing you start lifting your hand, you start worshiping God. And the next thing you know is this alignment takes place with body, soul, and spirit. The body gets in line and goes, hey, you know, this ain't that bad. The soul says, I told you it wasn't. And that fight goes on inside of you. I'm not saying you're schizophrenic or I am. Amen. I'm just saying that takes place. So, but, but your soul is the biggest part of you that relates to life. The rushes, the thrills, the sadness, the happiness. Your spirit's the biggest part of you that relates to eternity. Longing for home. The Bible calls it joy unspeakable. Peace that passes understanding. Amen. Your soul don't understand that, but your spirit does. I don't understand what just happened here, but I got peace over this situation. I just walked through the, through the valley of the shadow of death, and all of a sudden, I, I'm figuring this thing is okay with me. Your soul carries your purpose. Your mind, all you begin to think, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute, but your spirit drives your purpose. Your spirit reminds you, I got to stay, I got a little time here on this earth. I got to keep driving this thing. The soul is the essence of humanity's being. It is who we are. The spirit is the aspect of humanity that connects you with God. Now, let's talk about spirit here. Numbers chapter 14, verse 24. But my servant Caleb, you remember, and let me just say something about Joshua and Caleb. I've been studying a lot on succession lately. I know there's no success without a successor. And as I know that I'll be 59 next week, and that means I'm getting closer to 60 and moving on up in the age. I got so many friends behind me that's already retired. I don't think about retiring. I think about refiring. But I know that there comes a day somewhere, three, four, five years from now, that there needs to be a succession. I understand that. But when I watch what happened with Moses, and as Moses got to the edge of the promised land, and then I can't prove it, but I think God killed him. And got rid of him. Amen. And then Joshua entered in. The waters of the Jordan closed. That was Joshua and Caleb for 40, 80 years now. 80 years, Joshua and Caleb have been running together. They watched the whole generation die off. But Caleb, not one time, rose up against Joshua and, and tried to usurp authority over him. He was cool with who he was and what he wanted to do. He knew the mantle had fallen on Joshua. You don't hear an argument, but all through the Scripture, you'll see Joshua and Caleb running together. But then there came that time when Caleb just stepped back, and he just supported Joshua. That's the kind of men and women we need in the house of God. Can you get an amen? But the servant Caleb was a, had a different attitude. That word is spirit than the others have. He has remained loyal to me, so I will bring him into the land he explored. His descendants will possess their full share of that land. When the scripture talks about a man's spirit, it's usually speaking of this inner force which animates a person in one direction or another. It is repeatedly shown as a mover, a dynamic force, an unction, an anointing. Something began to move them. That spirit inside of you. And again, I can't, it's hard for me to try to divide all three of these up. I understand body. So do you. But when it comes soul and spirit, you know, I mean, they're so close to each other. But David talked about restoring his soul, not his spirit. And when I walk through this, you know, and I believe when we educate and we nurture our soul, our mind, it gives us the ability to stay more current in our time. I took a book with me. I traveled to Montana this week to a, uh, a, a mission summit. really affected me, age because I realized in a lot of ways we let the ball slip, or I have, when it comes to missions, world missions. I met, I met with guys from the Ukraine. Amazing. We didn't talk one time about politics. Amen. And we talked about the gospel and how the gospel is reaching that frozen tundra on, on, on the, uh, uh, the south side, south, south, the southern part of Russia. I met uh, J uh, missionaries to Japan and, and those from South America. And, and we just began to talk and I began to listen to them about their hearts crying, how God is moving all around the world. There was something began to work inside of me. And I began to realize I, I've, I've, got to, I've got to nurture this moment. I read books and I stayed outside. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But when you are hurt, your spirit is not hurt. Your soul is. It hurt my feelings. I'm hurt. And you're fighting it in your mind. And if you try to deal with it in your mind, you're going to stay hurt. You've got to let your spirit get involved in this thing. Amen. You've got to say, Spirit, I need your help here.
Amen. Who I really am. I can't live in, in locked up in the mind of somebody. I can't let somebody hold me prisoner over unforgiveness. I refuse to allow that to happen. Amen. I'm not going to do it. So your spirit connects you straight to God, the healer, to influence your soul to be healed. Psalm 142, David said this. I think David was an emotional man. I think when David took Goliath's head off, he wasn't stoic about it at all. I think he held that head up and let everybody know, I got that boy. Amen. I think he hung it up in his tent right next to the lion and the bear. I think David was probably one of the first taxidermists you ever met. I just see David. I mean, he's just a cool guy. He's emotional about things. He, he's excited about things. But, but Psalm 142, he makes this statement. He said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed him my trouble. God, this is my problems. Then my spirit was overwhelmed within me. Then thou knewest my path and the way wherein I walked. Have, have they privately laid a snare for me? I looked on my right hand and beheld there was no man that would know me and, and, and refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto him, O Lord, and I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison. You ever seen your mind get locked down? Amen. Where you're constantly thinking about something that's made you prisoner. Amen. Whether it be an addiction that you're fighting or, or an unforgiveness that you're dealing with, this your mind is just locked. You, you, you look at them and you, they're looking at you, but they're somewhere else. David said, my mind was this way. Get my soul out of prison that I may praise your name. The righteous shall come past me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with, me, bountifully with me. The soul often becomes the mediator between your spirit and your physical. So if your soul is drained, life can't make sense. I'm a giver. I've been my whole life, seemed like. I give out emotionally, physically, financially. I give and give and give. And after a while, my soul gets tired. You get wore out from doing it. And you wonder, just like David, is there anybody, any man going to attend to my soul? Anybody going to help pour in? I appreciate the words you said, David, in the beginning. Uh, uh, and, I, and you've always been good to me, church. But I'm just telling you that in life, uh, you, you emotionally you use the word drained. You just get drained. And I, I listened to these preachers talking up there. This was funny to me. I listened to these pastors talk about, and they said, yeah, they were younger than me, and they were talking about, we, we, we're going to start cutting our preaching down to about 35, 38 times a year. I've preached 5,000, over 5,000 sermons since I started this church. 5,000. Usually four times a week up until last year when we cut it back. At least twice on Sunday. And this week, and then you add yesterday's funeral. And I'm listening to these guys talk about, yeah, we're going to take a couple of months off sabbatical. What are you talking about? I preach 51 weeks out of the year. I take a Sunday off to take a bike ride. And then I have people that complain about that. I said to myself, I'm taking two weeks off this year. I'm serious. Ain't nobody going to take off for me. So I got to decide. I, if I got to take, take a break, I take a break. God's gave us great preachers in his house. So I can just turn them loose and let them do what they do. And I'll come back and clean up their mess later. <laughs> you get tired, Dad. You get tired, Mom. Your soul is draining. You've gone through life, Grandma, Grandpa. You didn't ask to raise your grandkids, but they were thrown upon you, and you did. You've dealt with life over and over and over again. You're a young mother and you, you didn't know how to handle this. You start walking through life and, and then you get into business and now financially you, you're going with this ups and downs and political things and all these things are happening in your life and it affects you financially. And you start getting drained. You start getting tired. You start getting wore out. You got to care for your soul. You got to care for it. I, was, I have a friend who's, who's been helping me the last uh, uh, several weeks. I, uh, I've been, people think I've been working out. I don't work out. I'm in rehab. <laughs> Can I be honest with you? I'm just in rehab. Because uh, this body has just, just been beat up. I pop. I mean, he, he looks at me every time he walks by. He hears the popping on my shoulder, my knee. And he goes, all right, let's try a little bit more. And, but it's getting better and better. So I'm thinking, okay, I might can work my way out of this. So I'm, I'm, I'm rehab. But I looked at him the other day because I, I knew that. And, uh, and this, is, this is just his life. He told me a story about his, his dad who took his own life. His dad was a doctor. His dad had uh, 
had prestige, had money, had buildings named after him downtown. And in his 50s, his body started breaking down, his earth suit, his dirt. And he felt like he couldn't go on. Christian man. And he took his life. So I looked at him and I said, uh, called him by name. Give me the next scripture, please. I said, I want to read a scripture to you and you tell me what you think it means. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I read that. And I want you to hear me. I can't prove what I'm going to say, but I'm, I wish I could. But I said, your spirit, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To live as Christ, to die as gain. To be, this, my spirit is what got born again. My soul is in the sanctification process, being cleaned up. And my body is being glorified. And I said, I've done too many funerals. I looked at him and I said, what did that mean to you? He said, well, I, I, what I'm, I, I'm thinking is that it means my dad probably went to hell. And I said, look at it again. The word soul is the word psyche, psychology, the study of the mind. Amen. The word spirit is pneuma, the breath and wind of God. We have put a lot of people in hell because of soulish issues. What would it do for a man or woman to gain the whole world and lose their mind? You get, you know, in life, and this is where our, our storage buildings come in and all this other stuff. We gain so much stuff. I got stuff. Man, I've been through two floods and I still got stuff. Man, I've had stuff taken away and I still got stuff. I got a house full of stuff. It's everywhere. I thought, I thought we lost this. And the things I wish I didn't lose, I, I, I got, I couldn't, uh, you know, they're gone. So I just bought them again. Everybody needs a, a blender. What would it do to gain the whole world and lose your mind? That you got everything going for you. And all that stuff wore you out. You couldn't be a daddy. You couldn't be a mama. You couldn't be a brother. You couldn't be a sister. Because all you've been having to deal with is all your stuff. And it caused you to lose your mind. Mm. A lot of things that have taken place in life have been more soulless than spirit. And I, I can't put, you know, I, somebody said, well, what does that mean they didn't go? I'm not trying to give anybody a license to do anything like that. I'm just telling you this, that there are times that I cannot play God. I got to let God be God. Amen. You got to care for it. Yeah, I, I, I like, you know, you ever listen to soul music? A certain music. You know, I, I love watching J.J. up here. That girl got soul. Certain music hit that girl and she get to going. I'm thinking, where'd she learn that move? I know it wasn't from David. <laughs> the girl got grooves. She got moves. She got soul music. Amen. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound soul. My soul is sound. This is what we want. Unless God restores our soul, we live afraid. Come on up here, Mary, if you would. We live afraid that our inner light will be extinguished and our inner darkness will be exposed. But I have this hope. Hebrews 6, 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the God, I want my mind to stay right. I want my body to stay healed. I want my spirit to stay in love with you. Amen. We have this anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into that which, which is beyond the veil, which, in other words, brings us into his presence. Wholeness does not mean perfection. Please, listen, it don't. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of your life. In life, my friend brokenness comes you got to learn how to embrace it you got to say you know what i am hurt i've been with hurt i know about hurt i embrace that moment i understand this amen and knowing this gives me hope that human wholeness mine yours ours need not to be a utopian dream if we can use devastation as a seedbed for a new life god can bring it into our lives now how do, how do i deal with my soul josiah solitude i know you understand this we stuck you back in the woods in a little cabin Solitude may be demanded. Mm -hmm. And in our rat race, busy acting world, we forget how important it is yeah. just to sit and listen. Yep. Amen. To hear his voice. I was in Montana and I sat on a porch. All this fellowship and ministers inside. I went out and I sat on a porch, which, by the way, 
I told uh, the pastor there 20 years ago, you need to put a porch around this place. He thought, I can't do it. And he did. And he came outside and he said, you told me to put this porch. And I said, well, I'm enjoying it. Yeah. I sat out there with a cup of coffee and I began to think, what is it that little country church needs? What is it that I need? And I began to dwell on all of that. Listen, guys, solitude, there's a secret to it. Learning to get alone. When I first got in the ministry, it was all about being busy, busy, busy. And I, I got to make sure everybody knows I'm busy. They got to make sure I'm at the, at the hospitals, at the birth. You know, I heard the hatch, match, patch, and dispatch. I got to be at all of them. And I found out after you get 700, 800,000 people to consider you pastor, it's impossible. So there's times yesterday between the time I put some meat on the smoke and the time of the funeral, I got on my Harley. I took a ride, and I just thought, I love this moment. Just being alone with you, God, the wind blowing through my hair while I got it. Yeah. <laughs> the blessings of life, amen. What happens in solitude is this. You develop the ability to hear for God yourself. Even if I'm preaching, you say, well, I heard it from pastor. No, you did You heard something you, I might have said, but, but you picked up on something else. God dropped something else into your heart. He began to deal with you about something else. and you be, It could be business-minded. It could be family. But you begin to catch something. You hear for God yourself. It gives focus to your purpose. When I'm alone, I know what my purpose is now. To win the lost. To integrate the body. To nurture people. Get me back to that again, God. It gives focus on it. Your, your soul, again, carries your purpose. Your spirit drives your purpose. It develops a strength for discipline. Alone but not lonely. Boy, if you can get alone without being lonely... Get alone for a minute, not even looking at your phone. Get alone just for a little bit and say, I just want to be alone with him. I, I want to learn from him. This is what David did when he talked about restoration. Amen. It, it gives you the concept of God concerning you. The feelings of acceptance and significance. Divine wisdom. God begins to impart into you. He's downloading, if you would, into your spirit. Amen. That affects your soul and your body. Things start working together in harmony. It eliminates voices that affirm you in your present. Did you know that certain people, they affirm you right where you're at? Yes, you're sick. Yes, you're messed up. Yes, you're broke. Yes, you're bankrupt. Yes, you're, you're spiritually blind. Yes, you're there. They'll affirm you where you're at, but they don't help you for where you're going. Yeah. Amen. I want a voice. That's why I like talking to my pastor. He's always pushing me forward. Always talking about my future. Always dealing with tomorrow. Amen. To keep going. I need a voice like that. I need to eliminate all the voices that remind me of my failures of my past when I when they realized that I was a preach preacher. Verse 3. Psalm 23. We close. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of right. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil. You're with me. As a comfort knowing. When David said that, he said, I know God's with me. I had a guy try to tell me that David, I said, David never had a miracle. All through David's life, David never had one miracle. He said, you don't think hitting Goliath in the head was a miracle? I said, absolutely not. I think it was skill. I think he done killed a lion. He done throw his resume down. I done killed a lion. I killed a bear. The Spirit of God is in me. And I'm going to take that giant out. Amen. He, he, he didn't have any of that. But what he needed, and, that's, and that blesses me. Because we're, so, uh, we're so driven by healing. We're so driven by miracles. And we know we've seen them. And we know that they happen. But, but when I look at David's life, I say, God, if I never see another miracle, I'm good with you. I'm good with you. But what I need you to do right now is restore my soul, my mind, my emotions, my zest for life. Restore my mind. Now, I'm going to go one step forward. I've never talked about this before. But many of you, I've walked with you, with your parents and others who had Alzheimer's. I, myself, have seen it in my dad's life. And I thank God that's got to be a soulish. Miss Diane, it's got to be a soulish disease because it affects the mind. And I'm asking God now, now that I'm, I'm knocking on 60's door, let me pray for other people. And let me rebuke that soulish disease that tries to take the mind from people you love. Amen. That, that we can get into that place and start believing God for that. Because many times we don't know what to do. Now, we used to call it sundowners. My dad would use the term, granny's mind is going gray. I, I've heard it my whole life. I've seen it. Maybe I could get into a place in life where I can say, God, I'm not afraid to pray against this disease. 
Because I understand it is soulish. It's affecting their mind. And I want their mind to stay. Amen. Because here's what happens. When your mind goes down, your body goes next. Your spirit's still alive. That spirit's alive inside there. I'll never forget praying for a lady who was in her uh, early 90s. She's almost dead. As a matter of fact, they gave up on her, said she was gone. She was dead. And I, I walked in to pray with her just one last time. And I was, walked in before this little saint. I started singing, Blessed Assurance. And she said, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, all is at rest. And then, then I shifted again. Her eyes are still closed. She's, she's dead by all intents and purposes. Her, her, her dirt is passing away. Her soul, her mind, she ain't spoken three days, Pastor. And then I said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And she started singing. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. And then I slipped out of the room. And two hours later, she slipped into heaven. Your spirit is so alive. So quick inside of you. But your soul, when your mind starts going, your body starts going. Tune them up. Work on them. I know we just finished times of fasting. Why not continue? Why not keep pressing? Listen, when my soul is restored, He'll lead me through paths that are right. When my soul is restored, I won't have fear of death or evil. When my soul is restored, I can be corrected and comforted. When my soul is restored, my enemies have to watch me enjoy life. When my soul is restored, I will be anointed. My cup won't hold the blessings in my life. When my soul is restored, goodness and mercy will follow me through this life. And finally, I will live in God's house forever. Restored, restored, restored. Restore my soul. Amen. In Jesus' name. No man can restore your soul. No woman can restore your soul. There ain't enough money to restore your soul. There ain't enough activities to restore your soul. You have to get in solitude with God. And you got to be honest with Him. Restore my soul. Your head's bowed just for a moment. Spirit of God, you're all over this place. 